I'm Lizzie Friedman, this is Inside Ambition, and you're on 34th and Art, the place where we talk all things arts and entertainment in and around Drexel University. This week we're taking a look at Pull Back the Curtain, a new Philly theater podcast produced by entertainment and arts management senior Margot Catalonia as her final thesis project. A common graduation requirement for many Drexel students is a senior project, or a thesis. These projects are worked on the entirety of a student's senior year and culminate in a presentation in their final term. Because Drexel loves to give you a challenge right when you see the end of that tunnel. Senior projects are a great way to encapsulate all you've learned at your time at Drexel and share that with the world. And you get to gear it to exactly what you like and want to do. Totally not stressful at all. Pull Back the Curtain informs next generation's art managers about marginalized genders, voices, and experiences in the theater world. The she hers and the they thems of this world have been silenced for way too long. It's time to let those voices ring out. I personally love podcasts. Big shout out to Michael Barbaro from The Daily of the New York Times. Love you, Mike. Let me know in the comments down below what your favorite podcast is, and if you need any recommendations, I've got a long list. Podcasts are the future and the present of receiving information. And to talk to me further about this podcast, I have the ever brilliant creator Margot Catalonia here with me today. Hi Margot, thanks so much for joining me. Hi Lizzie, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so yeah, let's just get right into it. <laughs> So what inspired you to do this project? Ooh, great question. <laughs> um, well, I knew for a senior project, I did not want to do a show that in a pandemic. That was pretty much the only thing I knew. Um, so I kind of considered what are my other options in a pandemic that would be safe. <laughs> and a podcast was a big thing um, that could serve as a project. So a lot of things happened over the summer in Philly theater. Um, some like sexual assault allegations came out, also like the social justice movements of the summer. Um, a lot of things were happening <laughs> and there were a lot of conversations in a Philly theater Facebook group that I'm a part of. And a lot of the conversations made me think about what Philly theater is doing correctly and what we're doing maybe wrong or what we could be doing better and where we want to see it going forward from here. Um, and I wanted to give artists an opportunity to talk about that for themselves and have us as next generation arts leaders learn from them. So not just going into the industry and being like, all right, I kind of heard that this happened here and like you had a bad experience, but like, let's talk about solutions and where we want it to actually go in this industry from here. Yeah, I think that's that's really terrific. And I think that at Drexel, like with EAM, I mean, we both know, like that's something that we talk about a lot is like, how do we like really enact change? Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's really awesome. And I remember hearing about all that stuff in the summer and being like, oh my God, like I can't believe this is the theater world that I am trying to work in. Like, Yeah, <laughs> especially yeah. for young leaders, it's like, okay, where's my place in this? And a lot of it is kind of like, okay, listen to your elders, listen to the older generation because they are in it. Um, but I wanted to bridge that gap a little bit more and like have that connection more. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really incredible. Um, and a little bit kind of on the same note, uh, how what was it like to uh, kind of do your senior project during a pandemic? And I know you, you did alter your, your course for that, of course. But yeah, what was that like? Um, it's been fun. <laughs> Um, I think it, it actually, because I decided I want to do a podcast, it lends itself really well. If we were in normal times, like I would probably invite artists into the studio, like the MI, that MIP uses or have higher quality equipment available, but there's still ways to do, to record a podcast, um, from your own home and make it safe. So I'm grateful that I found a way to make it work. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do a show, was going to do a show, kind of realized this is not what is best for me, um, and kind of wanted to also pick a project that I could do on my own um, so that I wouldn't have to rely on anyone else during a pandemic in case anyone gets sick. Um, so a lot of it was just like determining a lot of different factors um, and what was the most plausible financially and what I was also still passionate about and how I can make that work. Yeah, I think it's really amazing that you're following those safety guidelines and, you know, you were able to do something that like 
with everything changing, like you can still have it happen. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's really great emergency planning on your part. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Part of it too of like, uh, I talk to the artists a lot of like, oh, how much do we want to talk about COVID? Because you have to think of it like in this current context. Yeah, it's pervasive and it's all that's happening and all we know. But like, I want this to also be something that you can listen to two years from now. And like, I don't want it to be all about COVID too. So we do talk about it a little bit, especially like the accessibility part um, that COVID has lended itself to in a good way. But a lot of it is like, okay, this can live on past the current time. So like a senior project in bigger scope too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great. And I mean, it's also like, on it's up in like the internet verse forever. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important for people to be able to like come back to it and like still understand. Um, yeah, and then that also goes into my next question. Uh, what are you kind of hoping audiences kind of get out of this? Yeah, it's a great question too. Um, first, I hope that, so I have two audiences really. So the first audience is like you and me, like young arts leaders, next generation arts leaders who are coming up in this industry and not just theater, it's theater specific, but like arts as a whole, there's still the same values that you can take from it. Um, so our age and then the secondary audience is kind of just Philly theater in general, like listen to the artists that are around you. And even though they're giving advice to younger people, it is still applicable. Um, Cause each project you work on is kind of like you're that young student again. So it's very, it's very interesting. Um, but I hope it's to inform that generation first and foremost of like, these are the experiences firsthand. This is what I can learn from it and take into my account, whether you're going to be a production manager or a marketing person, like it's some, or even a performer, it's something that like in every facet you can take and be like, okay, well now I'm working with an artistic director. And I remember one artistic director saying on this podcast about this thing. So I should watch out for that. Um, and then also like as a means of connection, like if you're a freshman in EAM and you listen to the podcast and you hear like Gracie Hoffman talking about marketing and you're like, wow, Gracie's really cool. I want to talk to her. Like every artist gives their um, contact info at the end or like ways you can reach them. So it's also a way that you can be like, hey, Gracie, I heard what you said on the senior project podcast that you were on. Like, I would love to talk more about it with you. Um, and that could even like turn into a co-op or an internship. So a means of connection as well for that generation. Have there been any, um, has anyone that you've interviewed like really like sparked your interest about maybe like a different kind of position that you've thought about? Ooh, um, I don't know. I think it's really interesting hearing from those that are on the performance side, because for me, I'm on, I'm on the production side. I've done like the admin stuff, but like the creative performance side is like the one thing that I've never really involved in. So hearing from performers is super cool. Um, also, you'll find a lot in the arts in general that people are, artists are performers, but they'll also be like marketing or an admin thing. Like they're never just one thing, which is also really interesting. One of the more fascinating conversations I had was with Eli Lin. And they are a non-binary trans intimacy director and fight choreographer. And oh. intimacy direction is a really new field. Like, you know a little bit about it because we had an intimacy director on She Kills Monsters. Right. But it's really new in theater. Um, it's maybe from like 2018, it's only 2021. Like, talking to them was really cool because we never learn about this career in EAM because it's so new. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was really interesting. And I don't think I would do it myself, but it was just cool to see, hear how I can support them and their work as like an administrator. Yeah, definitely. I remember the first time hearing about an intimacy like director was in She Kills Monsters, which we did in like <laughs> 2019. I feel like with the arts, like new, more and more like positions are being made every day, like with what's happening with the world. And that's really interesting yeah. to see, yeah. Yeah, and like how we adapt to it. And I feel like in each conversation, it's always someone talking about how they're adapting to the situation. So yeah, intimacy direction is just like one of the tiny ways that the arts field is adapting. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. That is really cool. I'm excited to listen in on that episode. <laughs> so my next question, uh, how has 
this podcast and this process kind of given you an insight to like the theater industry that you're about to step into in like a, a few months? <laughs> yeah. Oh God, it's given me a lot of insight. Um, and like the good and the bad for sure. Like that's the whole point is like, I love Philly theater. This is like a lot of what I know in theater, even though I didn't grow up here is here. Mm -hmm. um, because that's when I started getting into theater. But there's also really bad stuff that we need to be aware of. Um, like the systemic issues that come up, the casting issues that come up. It's really good to hear about it from hopefully a future administrator side that I'm coming from as like, okay, I can enact change at that level. Um, especially hearing from people who have similar jobs, like as a stage manager, when I was talking to Pat Adams, a really cool stage manager, like an amazing Philly theater person. Um, she talked a lot about how her take and perspective on the role of stage management has changed over the years and how she is also a creator in the room and she is just as much a part of this artistic process as everyone else. And that's something that I really loved because I always thought stage management was like, okay, sit back, do the paperwork, let the artists do their thing. So it was really nice to hear like, no, I also have a role in that process going forward. That's something I can bring to the room if I stage manage again after college. And then that's also something it can apply to an administrator management position too. Like you still have a role as an artist, um, no matter what you're doing, even if you're not just on the creative side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I definitely noticed also, like, coming into uh, the EAM program. I, before college, I identified strictly as a performer, you know, an, an actor, like, all those things. So coming into, into Drexel, I was like, oh, so I can only be either a performer or I can be an administrator. Like, there's no, I can't be both. But it's like, no, like, you totally can. Yeah, like, yeah. most theater professionals have, like, a bajillion titles after their name because you can do so many things because they're so so correlated um yes. yeah no one's ever just one thing um and it was something that i had talked to joe vito ramirez who um is a non-binary performer and props person which is really mm -hmm. cool um and they were saying like no we need arts administrators that are courageous and bold and like won't just do the paperwork like you also have a role in this like and it was great to hear that from a performer so it's not just like the administration side being like no we have a role it's like no the other side thinks that we have a role too and we do yeah that's super interesting I like love to hear that because I remember like being so worried about like oh my god I can only be one <laughs> like yeah and I'm realizing that it's not that linear at all exactly yeah um, well, I really only have one final question for you, and that is how can we tune into your podcast once it comes out? Yes, um, please, yes, please listen. Um, it will be coming out, the first episode will be coming out next Wednesday, um, February 17th, and you can listen to it pretty much anywhere you get your podcast. So there is a, so there's an Instagram called at pullback the curtain pod and the link in the bio will take you to all the links about the artist um, and where you can listen and i'm distributing the podcast through anchor and then anchor is a distribu distribution platform that sends it to spotify apple music um google podcasts all that good stuff so as long as you get to anchor and search that um you can find everything else and we'll definitely have all of the information for uh, pull back the curtain right on the description box below <laughs> and everywhere else people can find it <laughs> um yeah well thank you so so much for joining me here today and talking a little bit about your senior project i can't wait to tune in <laughs> next week <laughs> how many episodes are there actually there are um 13 episodes um there are 14 artists but one of them is like a duo episode mm. Um, so 13 episodes, 14 artists. <laughs> gotcha. The little thing is that I added, um, our friend Vita Manalang is my 14th artist that I just added like last minute. Um, and if you don't know Vita, they are awesome. They have done a lot of shows here, um, with the co-op theater company. Um, and they're, they're a psych major at Drexel, but they do a lot of art stuff. Um, but they will be on one of the podcasts later. 
So tune in for that too, for a little Drexel insider. Yes, uh, we love Vita. <laughs> They're so amazing. I'm so excited for that one too. They, have, they always have such brilliant things to say. So I'm sure it'll be great. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Margot, for coming on 34th and Art with me. Uh, good luck with your project and with the rest of your time here at Drexel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's really so amazing to see more and more content being created by marginalized groups in our society. Every time I hear a white man talking about his success, especially in the arts and entertainment industry, five years of my life gets shaved off. And with that math, I might be dead soon. Seeing your projects allow students to leave that lasting impression that they want to leave at this university that they've spent so much time at and that has seen them at their very, very best and definitely at their very, very worst. Be sure to check out Pull Back the Curtain podcast on Instagram at Pull Back the Curtain Pod and let us know your thoughts. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at inside underscore ambition and subscribe to us right here on YouTube for all the latest. I'll see you right here at the same address next week. Bye.